the slide. Next slide. There we go. So the words unprecedented efficiency has been used endlessly whenever we think about drones in the context of work. So in relation to asset inspection, drones are data acquisition tools, uh, superior ones they, that enhance the efficiency, reduce costs, and improve safety if you compare it to um, traditional techniques. Over to the next slide. Our latest and most advanced platform is the Matrice 300 RTK. And on the left, you will see, uh, let, allow me to just highlight some key features that are relevant for asset inspection. First would be live mission recording. So what this means is if you've conducted um, an asset inspection mission or a surveying mission, the the it will be able to save like sample mission files. So if you want to conduct the same mission again, it can do so in an automated manner. It also comes with AI spot check. So if you want to select an area of the asset uh, that you want to inspect closely, um, it will um, conduct like an automated um, inspection of that certain spot. And it, you can, it can do so in a consistent way um, as you repeat that inspection. If you also want to um, conduct the inspection manually, we have Waypoints 2.0, which means that you could create up to 65,635 waypoints and conduct like multiple actions of one or more payloads because the matrice, with the Matrice 300 RTK, you could actually attach up to three payloads. It's also RTK enabled. So this is the promise that we have to all our customers that um, future um, drones will have RTK so to ensure um, precision and accuracy in your inspections. Uh, the next slide, um, of course, we have the camera, which is the Zenmuse H20T, T for thermal. So it's a quad sensor solution, meaning it has four sensors. First, it has the 20 megapixel zoom camera, a 12 megapixel wide camera, a laser range finder, and a radiometric. Uh, thermal camera. These are the specs of the radiometric thermal camera, which is quite um, good and um, um, good enough for asset inspection. Um, it also comes with intelligent features. Um, same with the Zen Muse XT2, if you're familiar with that. So it has temp alarm, isotherms, gain modes, RJPEG images, color palettes, and etc. Um, what the Zen Muse H22 do. It also provides accurate temperature measurement. So an example would be spot meter. So if you want to tap a point to get a real-time reading of the surface temperature, that's possible. Uh, next slide. It also has area measurement. So if you want to select a certain area of the asset that you want to expect, you can find out what the lowest, highest, and average temperatures are. So that's it. I hope it gives you a good overview of the M300 and Zenmuse H20T. I didn't delve into it that much because the focus of this webinar is really to educate you on how to conduct um, uh, thermal surveying with um, the, these solutions. Uh, I now hand it over to um, Ray, who will share with you some insights on how to perform these thermal image surveying tasks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ray Faulkner. Um, I'm director at uh, iRed Limited, and we've been conducting uh, thermographic surveys uh, for about 18 years, and we have been conducting aerial thermographic surveys since 2012. We, um, the, the the purpose of today's uh, uh, talk is to start to introduce you to some of the features of the H20T and to how it can be incorporated into the workflow of your um, test and inspection. Before we do any surveys, um, we would try to get you to think about why you're doing that, that particular survey. What, what is it that you want to achieve? Unlike many other uh, sensors that you can just bolt onto a drone or, or to the end of a pole, um, we need to realize that thermal imaging cameras detect heat. They know nothing about the visual light spectrum at all. And 
in order to capture that heat, we need to understand how the target surfaces are reacting um, to the uh, emission of radiation that's coming from them. This particular camera um, has the teeth of the thermal. It is a, what we call a radiometric camera. That means that it will store the data um, surrounding the image within the actual image itself. And when we come to post-process those images, it will allow us to manipulate uh, level, range, span, uh, emissivity, and a number of other factors that go about it. If the survey that you are doing is uh, limited to, um, say, search and rescue, this is much more immediate. You are interested in the here and now, you're interested in what you can see. Um, the purpose of this seminar is more to uh, introduce you to the idea of test and inspection. For that, we will want to capture those images and we will want to have a period of uh, reflective consideration so that we can analyze those images and therefore produce the report um, that we want to hand off to our client. So right from the off, we need to think about things like environmental conditions. Um, emissivity is, uh, is a, a, a key component to anything that we do with, uh, with um, infrared. We need to consider the background radiation, distance, humidity, and then it, the, the subjects go on to um, how we wish to display it in terms of palette and uh, level range and span. The targets um, can range. Um, I'm going to primarily stick with looking at buildings because it, it, will, it will cover a number of the topics that, that uh, we're particularly interested in, in, in looking at today. But we could be looking at photovoltaics, we could be looking at wind farms, solar farms, um, high voltage pylons. There, there, there is a, a whole list of um, uh, topics that the drone-based thermal imaging camera could be used for. But for now, we'll think about buildings. The environmental conditions are going to dictate what we can um, look at, what we can actually, uh, the, what we can find out about. So, for instance, if we are interested in looking at, for argument's sake, roof-mounted solar panels, we will want to do that during the day. And, and, that, and that actually is the good news for, for, for drone pilots, that you would like nice, warm, hot, sunny days where the sun is beating down onto the solar panel um, that is then converting it to electricity and then it's doing what its job is supposed to do. If, however, it's not working properly, we, we term it, it fails hot. In other words, it's not converting the sun's energy, therefore that energy is building up within the panel and the panel is getting warmer and warmer. And we would use the camera to identify that. There's a number of pieces of software around which will then take those thermal images and will now do uh, automated um, analysis techniques for you. But this has been much more used for um, large solar parks, uh, solar farms, where they've got um, you know, hundreds of megawatts of, uh, of, of electricity being generated. But in the context of what I'm talking about here today, there are a lot of buildings, certainly within the temperate climates, that are using solar panels on their roof to try and just boost their own electricity. But they, they would, there is a need to be able to do the test inspection of it. So in those terms, we then need to be able to do this during the day. But equally, we might want to... We might want to... There's somebody coming through. I can... I can um, and, and, I'm sorry, the, the, um, the, the building in question, we might be interested in looking at heat loss coming from the building, in which case we need to think about how the environmental conditions have been set up. So we will want that building, and I, I'm going to use, for example, the UK or, or temperate climate, where you would normally want the building warmer and keeping the, keeping the heat in, so we will want to see any heat that is escaping from that building. For this to work effectively, um, we would normally teach people to say you want to go for a 10 degree temperature difference between the inside of the building and the outside of the building. This will allow us to spot small changes in temperature on the outside surface if, if in fact the insulation hasn't been working correctly. But we can't do this during the day. Um, we need to be able to um, get the splitters as, as, uh, as, as large as possible. 
Um, but we cannot afford for the self-same sun that was working well for our solar panels to now be hitting um, onto, the, onto the surface of the, of the building in question. Now, the next slide is in fact a ground-based um, shot. Um, this was, uh, uh, well, it was just, it genuinely was a mistake. Uh, we wouldn't normally show it, but it, 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 it gives the exact example that we want to show of how the sun is adversely affecting um, the, the building that we're trying to do the test on. So if I can use the laser pointer here, you can hopefully see that I'm um, showing the, the quite distinct diagonal line between what was the cooler part of the building from the night time to how the sun um, at the top here where the sun first captured the building and is, you can see the outline of the buildings that are behind me from where this where this shot was taken and as the sun has come over the top it is warming the surface of that building now if we have the building being warmed by the sun it it we cannot measure that amount that it is warmed it by but we can therefore not work out exactly what heat has been lost from that building um, and so therefore we can't do it so we would normally say we would uh, undertake that survey two hours before sunrise or a couple uh, sorry, sorry before sunrise or two hours after sunset to enable the building to um, have the heat that it gained from the sun during the day give it enough time to dissipate back to the water and night sky and therefore giving us this real uh, temperature that's going on on the building below we often say to students to look at the environment before you go diving into the actual topic that you're trying to understand look around you see what's going on with other buildings so here we can see that the buildings are completely white out there the, the the term we would use is they have blown out the top of our temperature scale um, in other words the sun has hit them completely and we cannot make any serious or sensible um, uh, diagnosis of what of what is going on there all materials above absolute zero either absorb reflect and emit radiant energy uh, it's one of the uh, facts of physics and we are interested in what is being radiated from any object our problem is that we end up getting a combination of of uh, what is being reflected from the object and what is being emitted from the object and the cameras are pretty good at, uh, at at being able to sort out this for you but what we must do as thermographers is we must be able to understand the materials that we are investigating and um oops, what's going on here? All right. sorry um, i just had something flash on the screen um we must be able to uh, set the camera up either in readiness for capturing the actual image or we must be able to do that in post um, once we've captured the image and when we get back to the office and we're going to start doing the analysis we would want to be able to um, uh, change different parts of the image and change the emissivity of the particular object that we that we are looking at so to give you an example of this um, Uh, this is a, um, a, a, an object called a Leslie cube. It's an aluminium box, and you can see the cork at the top here, and into it we pour warm water. And what I want you to imagine is that this warm water will have warmed this box um, to exactly the same temperature, whatever it may be. But when we look at it through a thermal camera, so let's go, let's go back a stage. If I put a temperature probe onto this spot or this spot or the top spot you would find that the temperature is exactly the same because it is it's, it's a body it's a body of water inside heated to whatever temperature uh, we have may have decided to use but when we look at the thermal image on the right hand side you can see that there's a very distinct change, apparent change in temperature you can see that this area um, on the left hand side of the leslie cube is a purpley color and that is mainly a reflective surface. We can see that it's this aluminium foil uh, that's been attached to the, to the cube. And therefore it is reflecting 
mostly what's the, the, the ambient temperature around it. Whereas the painted surfaces or the electrician's tape that has been stuck on onto the corners there are giving you a, a far closer to the actual, the real temperature that, the, that has been contained within it. As thermographers or as people who are looking at thermal images, we need to understand how that is going to affect us for whatever target we're looking at. So if we're looking at shiny metals, we will see that we will get um, uh, a, a lot of reflection of what may be going on. So to put that into context for you, um, this is an aerial shot that we took a, a number of years back. Um, it's taken up in Glasgow and the roof is uh, a metallic um, cladding and it is not genuinely cold. Um, it, we've got the blues here and then we've got the purples and blacks which if, if the temperature scale had been put on there would have shown that it was um, you know extremely cold. It's not. It is purely reflecting the very cold temperatures from outer space um, that are, that are uh, coming straight down onto it. So we would need to be able to um, write this within any reporting that's going, understand that there's nothing we can do about it, we just have to accept that we are looking at highly reflective surfaces and we either change the emissivity to account for it, therefore can give an accurate measurement, or recognise that actually if there was any um, hot spots within it or something leaking, such as over in this left hand corner here, um, it, it, it would um, punch through. But the ambient temperature in this image is really what we can see pretty well, this, this light greenish colour all around on the ground. That's pretty well telling you what the air temperature would be. Um, so how, and just the logic of it, how could this roof appear to be so much colder? And as I said, the answer is it is a reflective surface and we need to be able to recognise it and account for it in any reporting that we're going to do. Background radiation, uh, there's a number of ways of accounting for it, but background radiation is uh, a factor that we can put into the camera before we get going. Um, if we are doing a test inspection, we will attempt to measure it for the work we're doing. With uh, drone-based uh, cameras, we are essentially looking down, which means that the uh, uh, reflection is coming from what's behind the camera, which unfortunately is the night sky. And if you've got a clear sky, you could be looking at minus 50, minus 60 degrees Celsius is the effect of what is being radiated onto the surfaces that, um, that, that we have under inspection. And the effect of it can be something like this. We have uh, a thermographic image which looks rather confusing on the right hand side. Um, but we put the digital image in there to show you that if you look at the, in the glass panels of the uh, near face of the, of, the, uh, of the building, we can actually see this brick building reflected in the glass. Now that's in the visual light spectrum. And we, we understand that and, and, our, and our eyes have, have learned how to compensate for it. But thermally, we are now appearing to see what is so much warmer. But the reality is that we are reflecting the heat from this brick building onto the low emissivic target, or rather the high reflective target that this building purports to be. And that therefore then makes it a lot more difficult to start measuring accurately. We would have to either uh, block out, if we, were, if we were interested in a particular part of, of that building, we would either have to block out the reflection, or we're going to have to go about it in a slightly different way. So for instance, um, we might decide that we're interested in the windows um, or we want to see if there's any leakage in the windows. Well, we can start to look, say, higher up in the building and we'd get an idea. We can see a slight red uh, heat loss on the side, which is replicated as we move along on other windows. So it is reasonable to think that if we see heat in, in uh, lower down, that it could be following a similar sort of pattern. But we need to be very, very careful in the way that we will um, describe what we're seeing. We certainly cannot say that the ground floor on this building is losing a lot of heat and the upper floors aren't. Um, it, that, that, that would be just obviously complete rubbish. And so therefore, it's an, it's an exaggerated example, but it, I put it in there for you to understand that 
um, when we were looking at the, 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 the first house, that was a function of it actually being heated adversely by the sun. But here we have, again, this apparent um, heat that's now on the surface, but this is purely reflection and is bad for, for what we want to be able to produce. We do have other problems that we need to uh, think about, but if, if you're a drone pilot, you wouldn't want to be flying in fog anyway. So, um, but again, it's a ground-based example. I haven't, um, I haven't got any aerial ones where, where this has become a, a feature. That left-hand image is not badly focused. Um, it would be very easy to think in those terms, but I, I would ask you to now look at the staircase and you can see, you can see the handrail on that staircase very, very clearly. So that is a focused image and the thermographer has done his job properly there. What he hasn't done is used the right environmental conditions. So we have this very wishy-washy um, appearance of the building. Yes, on the right hand side, again, it, it, it looks more obviously a focused image, which is good. But we can now start to uh, see um, individual differences. So for instance, um, below the window here, we can see individual bricks and we're able to, able to identify them. Now this will mean that we'll be able to measure. It means that we can, we can use the spot temperatures and find out exactly what's going on, right down to uh, um, 0.1 of a degree. I know the specification will tell you it's 50 millikelvin, but the output of these cameras will generally go down to 0.1. Um, and, and that's the way it goes. But this particular camera again, um, that, that's being promoted here, the H20, that's as good as, as any normal ground-based camera. Um, 640 by 512 is an excellent resolution um, and is one that will be capable of giving you these sort of images that, that you're looking at at the moment. But you do need to be very careful about, the, um, uh, about how um, uh, your, the, the environmental conditions that you are going to use. The, the basis of the, the talk was saying always capture images as radiometric images, in our opinion. Um, a number of cameras are non-radiometric, or rather the camera itself is, but the saving of the image isn't. If it isn't, it is no more than a Photoshop image, it's just an ordinary JPEG, and you can only do the manipulation that uh, anybody else with Photoshop can do. If we have a radiometric JPEG, you need to think of it in terms, not of um, in digital ways, the, the, the way you think about pixels, but actually think about it in terms of um, an Excel spreadsheet. It's probably a nearer analogy to use. Think of it as 640 um, uh, columns by uh, 512 rows. And in each of those cells is a number, and that number represents a temperature. We only have the visual representation because our eyes work in the visual light spectrum and we don't and we cannot see in the infrared spectrum and so we use the computers to be able to generate these false color is one word uh, but to use and create these colored images but it equally allows us to manipulate and to change how we're going to present those images across so by having a radiometric image what we're able to do here is and i'm going to put the, the next slide will just give uh, hopefully give you a bit of a grid and we use a a, a common way of capturing buildings is to use a, a technique called sky hooking and this is where we'll hold the drone in a uh, into a, a geostationary position and then we will rotate the gimbal underneath the drone so we try and hold the drone absolutely still and and then we will go in arcs, drop it down, and then arc again. Now, for those of you who are used to photogrammetry, 3D modeling, um, uh, any of these, uh, these other sort of techniques, thermal works differently. Uh, you don't want too much of an overlap. You'd be far better off sticking to about a quarter, maximum of a third of the image being overlapped. The, the more you have, uh, that the harder it, it actually becomes to line it all up. You're, you're better off not, not having too much. And I've deliberately left 
this image with, without all of the, uh, or without finishing it off. So you can see the gaps and, and hopefully you can get an idea of how the camera has captured each of these images as you, as you go through the grid. And then it allows us to put it all together. We can, and, and we were only able to do this because we were able to equalize all of the images. If they had been taken on an auto span, for instance, through the camera, when, when we get to look at them individually, all the colors would be all over the place. So we will change that, that level and span so that they're all showing exactly the same. They, they, will, um, they will have the same temperature scale on each. We can then join them all together and then create the report as, as we want to do. And it will allow us to then pick up on the, uh, the individual um, uh, analysis point that's, uh, that's important to us. The importance of level range and span, these, these are terms that you may not have heard of before, um, but I'm going to use, a, again, I'm afraid, another ground-based example that, that we've used within training courses. And um, I'm going to ask you to just, just play a little game with yourselves, actually. So which of, this, which of these buildings losing the most heat? So this, this, is, this is my office uh, building. And we went off and we, we took this, these images, as you can see. So on the left, we essentially have um, uh, the building and it's a, a red um, in, on the upper floors and a green yellow on, on the lower floors. And if I say to you that it is a standard um, uh, scale that we would um, um, uh, rainbow scale where white will be the very hottest and black will be the, will be the coldest. Um, that will give you some sort of an idea of, of red, red being hot and blue being cold. So have a think, have a look at it. So when was the left-hand image taken? When was the right-hand image taken? Um, was it taken in the day? Was it taken at night? Um, was it taken in the summer? Was it taken in the winter? And then equally look at the right-hand image and, and play the same sort of game and see if you can come up with any, uh, with, with any sort of thoughts. And that there's actually an awful lot going on in both of those images, um, and we, 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 we could analyze these for hours, but um, just in very, very simple, basic terms. Um, some of you out there will not have looked or understood thermal imaging before, um, but if you're honest, I think what you'll probably say is the left-hand one was either taken during the day or it was taken uh, in the summer and the right hand one was taken at night or taken in winter. Certainly that is the uh, standard response that we get from many people. Now I want you to look at the temperature scales that I've put on them. Now if we look at the left hand temperature scale, you will see that the span, that is the distance between the bottom of the scale and the top of the scale is 10 degrees. It actually goes from zero Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius. So what we're actually saying there is that anything that is within that image that is less than zero will only be seen as black. Look at the sky. All we can say about that is it is below zero. And anything that is white or above 10 degrees, we don't know what the temperature is, but we just know it's above 10. And anything in between is, has, been, uh, has now been colored as, as we can see there. Now the right-hand image also has a span of 10 degrees and this time it goes from 3 degrees to 13. The differential in other words is still only 10 degrees but the effect has been quite dramatic on how this this image will now appear and if you just gently go between the two and look at the scale and the scale is what separates a thermogram from an ordinary picture without one uh, we, we, we bang on about this all the time. You cannot make a sensible analysis without a temperature scale. But if you look on the upper floors of the left-hand building, it looks as though it's generally speaking somewhere between seven and eight degrees. And if you look at the right-hand building, equally the upper floors look as though they're somewhere between seven and eight degrees. They are the same image. They weren't taken at the same time. It is the same image. All that happened is that in post-production, we were able to manipulate the image. Now you can well imagine that um, this then gives the thermographer an awful lot of power and they can abuse that power. But sensibly speaking, there are a number of rules that we can put into place when we're, when we're actually doing the reporting and how we're going to communicate with our client. 
but I hope that this example will show you the importance of being able to sensibly look and, and um, analyze the images that are, that are going on. Very quickly, you have a number of palettes. Um, there are, will be palettes within the camera. Um, we found that people work better with different palettes. So if we're out in the field, you'll often find people will work, uh, certainly at night, if we're doing night surveys, we'll work in the grayscale, the black and white. It's far easier on the eyes, means you can work longer. Um, We've also found that within the electromechanical environment, the iron bow, in other words, the way a piece of steel would warm up and the colours that it would produce, seems to um, be, uh, resonate a lot better with engineers. So again, this is exactly what you've got to think about in terms of who your client is and, and, and how, what you're trying to communicate. Um, Rainbow high contrast is certainly one that we would use within the built environment because we are looking for uh, small nuances of difference um, and, and deltas and difference are very, very important to us in our understanding how a, how a building is actually working. So we would generally recommend the rainbow high contrast for the, uh, the, built, for the built environment. Um, but each to their own, there's, no, there's nothing that's been set in stone about it. But if you think about your uh, uh, your, your client again and how you're going to communicate with them, that will often dictate um, the, the, the best thing to do. Building surfaces need to be dry before you undertake a survey. Well, that makes sense as well, because um, you can think about, uh, well, just you as a, as a, as a human body. If, you're, if you get hot, uh, you'll sweat. And so if you put your arm that's got uh, uh, moisture on it and stick it out and waft it in the breeze, um, it's going to cool through evaporation. And the physics is exactly the same on a building. If you wet the building and you blow wind across it, it's going to cool. So we want to reduce these adverse and external effects as much as we possibly can. So we would normally say a building must be dry. But again, and I come right back to the beginning, it all depends on what you are trying to achieve. So I've now, this aerial image was one where we did need it to be wet when it started. It was raining two days ago. We had to time the survey because we were in particular interested in tracking where there was a leaking roof. So I'm going to uh, bring the next slide up, which will hopefully you've, you've got this white circle uh, stuck in the middle. And if the laser pointer will work, we had a leak coming in through this skylight that, that I'm uh, circling with the laser. But what we can see is where the water here had been pooling underneath the surface of the roof, we can see where the moisture was tracking. And that then gives the engineers their, all right, they know exactly the point they need to go to to actually work out what, what's going on. Um, so we have to think about what we're trying to achieve. We were using the sun to warm the roof. We were, we were noting that dry materials will warm quicker in the sun, but they'll cool quicker. Um, a prime example would be if you go down to the beach in the summer, um, you try walking on the hot sand during the day and it'll burn your feet. But this moment the sun has gone away and you're now walking in the sand at night, that sand can be very, very cold. So it's warmed up quickly and it's cooled down very quickly, but yet, where you have moisture or where you have wet uh, substances, they will take a lot longer to warm up, but they will equally take a lot longer to cool down. These scientific and these physical facts we will use to our advantage in determining when we will do the survey. So this survey was done just after sunset, or this part of it was done just after sunset, so that we could capture these uh, tracking of where the moisture was, was going underneath the surface. However, interestingly, and as I say, we were there for a particular reason, um, but other things have come out of uh, being able to do drone surveys. And this one now is asked for um, quite a lot. Um, you will hear the term um, uh, uh, conference heating where, where um, uh, towns or, or particular housing estates are all uh, heated from a central point. Well, this, this particular factory had a heating block that was 
uh, then piping hot water through to various parts of the factory. And there we can see the effect of leaking pipes. Um, it's curved, it's uh, not following a nice straight line as a pipe ought to. Um, and anyway, we, we were able to find that. Far easier to find leaking pipes using a drone over, um, over open ground than it is to be on the ground itself uh, using a camera. And then finally, um, we were able to also work out the effects. If you look at all the windows there, and then look at the windows on the left-hand side, which I haven't circled, the left-hand side had recently been replaced. And what came from it all was they now wanted to measure the effectiveness of it. So there are techniques that we can use that we can actually calculate heat loss by looking at the thermal imaging. We would need to know inside air temperatures and um, there's, there's, there's a number of formulas that, that, that can be brought to bear. But you can certainly, even on a very um, top level, be able to give a, a good report uh, to the uh, directors of this factory and say, there you are losing a lot of heat through your windows. And here we are on the left-hand side, very effective windows that, uh, that have recently been installed. And finally, um, this is just an overview of a solar park. Um, what I wanted to be able to show you here was that we can see as well as measure. Now, seeing here was just to get an idea of this solar park. Um, the client didn't want any more, but where you can now see the circled areas, there's soiling to the actual uh, panel going on here. Uh, if you look at these two um, small vertical lines, um, these will be, um, um, uh, well, I've gone blank. <laughs> uh, definitely gone blank. Uh, string errors, substring errors, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, Normally, we would fly a lot closer, and then normally, as you, as you saw right on the early on in the presentation, um, software will be identifying the type of problems. This particular client just wanted a quick overview, and so therefore, the camera is well capable of seeing, even being quite stood off quite a long way, uh, that we can pick up these problems, and then it may be you will then zero in and then I want to go in to, to look for them. So that's really all I want to say, apart from, uh, well, now's the advert bit, and I've been asked to say that um, we do run a number of training courses. I think we've probably got the, the, the most varied number of courses for uh, drone and drone inspections. Um, and these will be a variety of classroom, um, online, and we are now launching uh, e-based learning uh, category one courses as well. So if any of you have any questions, please, um, happy to happy to answer. So, there's a question here from Sanjay Matthew. Um, my question is, which platform software do you use to create a or for radiometric, and also which pla platform can be used to create thermal inspection records? Um, okay. We, um, because of the number of um, um, because of the number of cameras that we have in operation and because of the, uh, the combination of ground-based and aerial, um, we tend to use um, FLIR software for ours. So we would export whatever camera we've been using. We would export the images into the FLIR software, which the XT and the XT2, obviously, it, they, they, di they directly work with it. Um, we can then manipulate those images within FLIR Tools Plus or we use Research IR. What we don't do though is we don't use any of their internal templates. Um, we've created our own templates in uh, basically Word. Um, I, I think some of them, um, we've, we've actually used some of the Adobe products as well. Um, but we, we've created our own, uh, our own um, templates and then we 
uh, import images, the manipulated images into that, and then we can we, then we can write it. We just found that far easier, so that we can send stuff backwards and forwards between the engineers and the um, and then the staff back in the office. So I hope that I hope that will answer that question for you. Um, and we have another one here from Carol. Oh, she asked, uh, "Capture thermograms for the H20 are not showing scale; they're just thermal fluid." only ways to do screen grab. Yeah, um, the camera itself, the H20, is a good camera. Um, the specifications on it are good. Um, the What it will be capable of doing is good. And I think, sorry, uh, Carol, what, uh, what you haven't actually asked at the moment, um, the other thing to remember is um, a number of the early drone thermal cameras have taken an inordinate amount of time to stabilize. That is the amount of time you need between turning it on and then being able to use it so that you have equality of, of, um, of uh, temperature across the, whole, across the whole screen. And the H20 can do it very, very quickly. I, I, we, we would sort of, uh, or I've been told that 10 minutes or so was absolutely fine to get that camera up to temperature and, and stabilized. But now in, in trying to answer your question, yes, at the moment, I think um, from test inspection purposes, the software for the H20 is still probably in alpha. Uh, they, 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 that, needs to be, that needs to be updated so that we can get at all of the controls that are within the camera, because they are there. Um, it's just being able to get at it afterwards. What else? Lewis Edwards. Um, how long does a typical drone survey take to complete while on site? That's a good question. Um, when we're doing one, um, we will very often use a combination of ground-based and aerial. Um, what you should do, or our recommendation to you, would be to make sure you've got all the site plans and everything else. Everything you would do for planning a drone survey. Is, is standard. But now pick your um, um, target points where, where you want to be. So um, we, we find that to actually present still images of a, of a building, we will guesstimate exactly where we want to be. And that's what I was talking about earlier. We, we will skyhook. We do that quite a lot. Um, we will hold the camera in that one position, launch it, um, take it up to the height we want, I don't know, uh, 30 meters or so. And we will then take that series of shots. Now that, that particular flight may only take several minutes, drop it back down again, walk around to the other corner of the building and then pop it up and away you go again. Um, if we are doing a radiometric video, we may fly up and down, so large flat roof inspection, um, and then that's using, I don't know, um, you know what, 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 whatever software you prefer to use. Um, again, set it all up and then automate it so that, so that it's flying through. So I would say for um, uh, the, the test and inspection style, we are probably looking five to 10 minutes for each flight, but you may have something in the order of, I don't know, 10, 15 flights that you're going to do in the course of two to three hours that you're on site while somebody else is running around doing the ground-based ground -based survey. Uh, Daniel Gonzalez. Um, what software do you use to interpret anomalies found on solar panels? Um, there's a couple out there. Um, and the name is going to see. Hammer. Uh, no, Hammer is the, uh, is, is the flight software. No, there's the, uh, the Texan one that we Started to. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to. I'll have to drop you an, an email with that one that, that 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 we're using for that at the moment. There are two or three out there, um, and depending on who owns it, what the, the way that it works is that you'll either um, you know you 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 take out a cloud-based subscription, and then you can upload you know x megabyte of um, um, sorry megawatt of of images and then they'll charge you a fee um, to actually then process it and send it back to you um, what you need to be very very careful of though with all of these is the conditions that you are going to be um, operating under it's very easy for instance within solar panel world to say oh well, i'm going to um, utilize 
um, ISO 6 to, I can't remember one word of it, but the, 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 there is an ISO standard and it will turn around to you and say, um, you must um, uh, you, you, mu you must have um, at least uh, three pixels on a on a on a cell. So therefore, you, you've got a height restriction on you. You must have 600 watts meters square. Uh, the, the, you know the lumens um, that's going on. Um, you don't need it. Um, we've flown very happily at 300, which is half of what the um, what the standards uh, would say. And I think in the UK, you're going to be very hard pushed to be able to meet those standards anyway for the you know for the type of weather we that we have here. Um, so that it's probably more important rather than saying the actual software it's more important to agree what are the preconditions that you need for the capture of the software in order for it to be able to in order for it to be able to work Sophie Sandor. Uh, Sophie, would you rather analyze individual images instead of auto mosaics oh yes um, again actually very good question now Right at the beginning, I said you want to look at the environment, and I think the same holds for when you're going to do an analysis. Um, we seem to spend a lot of time telling people don't go looking for hotspots. If you see a hotspot, it ain't going to go away, it'll always be there. Go away from it in your mind and then look at the environment. So, what that will then mean is that if, um, um, and as you saw, the, the, that last roof shot that if you like is the is the author mosaic that is the the stitched image which will give you a very good overview of what's going on but when i was actually making creating the report for that leak we we had isolated that individual image and we were able to see exactly what the temperature differential was between the dry bit of roof the wet bit of roof and then work out how much how much water was 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 actually going going along it. So um, definitely the analysis of images should be done individually and they should be done radiometrically because you will find um, that when you're sitting there warm, dry with a cup of coffee and the computer screen, you are manipulating the emissivity, you'll be manipulating the palettes and the rate level range and span to to bring out of the image the bit that you're interested in looking at. Um, it's once you've done all of that and the communication, that's where the auto mosaic then makes sense to your client. Um, they don't like seeing individual images. There's not enough in there for the brain to, to be able to compute. They like to see, oh yes, I recognize that building. And then it's far easier from that point to zoom in to say, right, there's your overview. Now we're looking at the individual image. So, I, I would probably suggest to you I'd do it in that way, um, you know, delve down into it. But the individual image is vital to, a, to be able to actually understand exactly what's going on. Um, right, Robert Stone. Robert says, how critical are weather conditions, lighting conditions when inspecting power lines, electricity towers? Would one need to apply a similar approach to analysis of the images, wet surfaces? Um, yes, absolutely. Right, how critical? Um, I think one of the benefits of this particular system, the M300, for high power lines, is now we've got the RTK in there. That, that's a, a mega step forward. It means we can get closer. It means that we can have confidence of the targets that we're looking at. Um, however, you are generally looking at metals. Metals tend to be low emissivic targets, which means that they're highly reflective. So unless they're painted, which I suppose power lines generally are, because they've got rust inhibitors on them, um, uh, you, would, you would certainly want to be, make sure that you are differentiating between bare metal and uh, any covered surface. So that's important. Um, direct sunlight will be warming whatever, whatever target it, it, it hits. Um, and what you're interested in is seeing where there's resistance and if there's resistance there's going to be heat and it's that heat that you want to be able to see um, our experience of it is it, it, it pretty well stands out actually so um, the ideal time to do a, a electricity tower in my opinion would be cloudy overcast day that's dry um, with with little with little or no wind that would be perfect for me um, because then you know what I'd be seeing would be just genuine heat coming from um, from any of the um, insulators or, or connectors on it. Um, 
mobile Susie asked, wet surfaces. Well, you don't. You really do not want wet surfaces on anything when you're when you're dealing with thermography, because because you'll get the um, you'll get the uh, evaporative cooling is one thing that's going on. But you also will change the emissivity because of the surface of the water. Um, you know, and you you don't know how much of it is water and how much you know where it's dry and where it's wet. So you you want to avoid wet surfaces if you possibly could. Um, Right. Can live electricity power lines impact the results in a negative way? Um, I would say the live power lines before uh, were, we certainly would have had problems in, in the old days. We, we wouldn't be wanting to get too close because of the radio signal that was, uh, um, you know, that it was interfering with. But I think the RTK is, is, is a bit of a game changer. Um, actually, do also remember, and uh, actually looking at you, what you're asking here, remember that thermography works on live equipment. There would be no point in trying to look at that power line unless there was electricity. So the negative would be if they turned it off, you're not going to see anything because there'd be no fault. Um, you, you need it to actually be in its normal operating condition. Same with the buildings, same with solar panels. Uh, same with electromechanical um, inspections. You've always got to do it under its normal operational conditions in order to be able to see where, where, the, where the potential problems are going to be. Um, for beginners, which course from MyRed would you recommend to start with and how does the course work? Um, okay, Ooh, that's kind of you to ask that question, Lewis. Um, up to you, I think it's the, it's the honest answer. If, if you are just dipping your toe in the water and you want to see um, whether it is um, either a technique that you want to add on to the services, suite of services that you offer, um, we do the introductory type courses. I think if you have any serious interest in thermography, I would recommend the Aerial Cat one, without a doubt. It's a four, five day, five day, now, five day. Yeah, it's a five day course now. Um, we are launching the full e-learning version of it so that a number of the experiments and a number of the examples that we would normally have done face to face with people, we're filming it so that uh, th there is the ability to do this purely online. Um, my, own, my own feeling is that um, actually some tactile use, uh, being able to play with different cameras, being able to see what the different resolutions can do and just being able to talk it through is, is an unbeatable experience. So certainly our classroom based or our uh, online ones where it was tutor led, they, they, they've been invaluable those courses. But I completely recognize that um, people need to be able to study at their own pace. So that's why we're launching and it will be ready by the 1st of October um, that those courses will be available, the uh, category one drone, drone thermography course. Do you need special software? No, you don't. Um, uh, this is uh, again from Sophie. Do you need special to build an author mosaic? Um, no, you don't. What what you need is unfortunately a lot of hard work. Um, we we've got people who have been stitching images for a long time, and 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 it is a very very common question we're asked. Um, I quite happily say to people that a lot of our stitching still goes on in Photoshop, because that's what I was using years ago, and I've just all, I've just always used it. It does mean, and this is, I suppose, where the trick in it all comes. I don't stitch radiometric images. I export radiometric images into, J into ordinary JPEGs, and those are what I stitch. The, the radiometric ones I use for analysis, and I do that individually. Um, but there is no shortcut. Uh, it's, it, if you want to get a if you want to get a decent stitch, you've got to do it by hand. Um, I, there, there are a number of that people use successfully. If you don't try and put too many images together, Microsoft Ice apparently is very good. Um, that's worked with the XT2 out of the box. Um, but personally, I've, I've only I've, I've used Photoshop as the one that uh, that I use most of the time. Right, is Cat One course fully online? Uh, Yes, it is now. Um, that, that's the one that, that as I say, is, is now being launched uh, on 1st of October. And you'll be able to do the examination online as well. And afterwards, uh, for the competency element, um, you will need to have your own camera. You will need to be able to take your own images, send those over, and then we'll analyze them um, for you and then send you back. And then that will certificate you for, for, that, for that element of it. 
I would say that, um, um, trying to sort of rein it all in a bit, that, that um, the five day course, without doubt, is, um, is going to be really illuminating. I've only just touched on a few of the, uh, the elements to be, be very wary of if you're going to get into, into thermal imaging. Um, it is an exciting world and it is a new world. And I think that, to my mind, that is still very important. I, I thought this 15 years ago and I haven't changed my mind a jot on that. I am pleasantly surprised on how people are pushing the technology forward all the time and it's becoming more and more relevant. However, I would caution people, don't, don't try and run before you can walk. Um, it is straightforward, but take your time. Um, it's the, 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 we use that we use the expression baby steps quite a lot. Um, and what we say is, you, you know, you grew up thinking, you know, the red tap was hot water and the blue tap was cold water. Um, red and blue doesn't mean hot and cold anymore. So you've got to go back to baby steps. You've got to relearn uh, things and 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 question everything that you see in thermography. And I think if you build up that sort of experience, that will then make you good at the analysis, and then that will make you good at report writing. Right. So this is in terms of the battery life and basically how long, how much area that you can cover. Oh, right. Um, okay. I could add, um, with the Matrice 300 and the H20T, it can do like 43 minutes. Yeah, okay. With no pain. Uh, oh, oh, he's, he's, oh, I think he, what he's asking is what square meters can you do in that, in that sort of period oh. of time? Um, bleh. What did I do the other day? We did. Um... Oh, I think we're going to have to. I'm going to have to come back to you. I've got. I've got so many numbers flying around in my head. Um, you, you're going to do a lot. You're. You are going to do. I think. I think we worked out that you could do about uh, um, easily in a day in the UK now. Um, if we did a seven megawatt site, um, that could be broken up into four or five different sections, and we could do that in a day's flying within the UK. Um, I'm sure that was that was one of the numbers. I mean, yeah, if everything's together and it's flat and there aren't any radio masts and telegraph poles to be worrying about and things like this, um, we could we could probably do 10, uh, 10 megawatts a day. Um, after that, I think it, I think it started to be pushed. But um, 